What do you think these three things have in common? Scented candles, fancy bars of soap, and picture frames. Well, according to our friends at Google, these three items are the most re-gifted Christmas gifts. So in other words, scented candles, fancy bars of soap, and picture frames are the most likely gifts to be wrapped back up and set aside and gifted to someone else as another Christmas gift. Now, personal story here, I've learned that you have to be strategic about regifting. <laughs> Pam's brother gave us what we thought was an unopened toaster for our wedding. Well, we each already had a toaster, so we hung on to it and regifted it a few years later. And we got a thank you note for the nice, the, the pretty purple candles <laughs> in the box. So, so the greatest Christmas gift, I must say, is intended to be regifted, and our joy actually increases when we regift it. So we saw these first two uh, weeks in our Advent themes that our eternal hope is safe in God because He's committed to displaying His glory in our redemption, and that our faith in God. Uh, our faith is in God because he is always faithful to fulfill his word. So this morning, I hope to show you that our joy in Jesus Christ increases as we embrace and proclaim this gift of his gospel. Well, the Advent themes of uh, hope and faith and joy and peace tie in with the things that we value most as a church. So Trinity Church values God's glory, God's word, God's gospel, God's people, and God's mission, and they all tie together, as you know. So our hope is in God because of his commitment to his glory, and our faith is in God because he's always faithful to fulfill his word. So on this third Sunday in Advent, I, I hope to show you that our joy in Jesus Christ increases as we embrace and proclaim his gospel. So please turn with me to chapter 1 of the Gospel of Jesus, according to Luke. According to Luke. And then we will pray as we open God's word together. So God, I thank you for your word. Uh, God, I recognize that I am made of dust and you breathed life into me physically. And by your grace, you breathe life into me spiritually. So God, I thank you for this new life in Christ. God, I thank you that you call us each to uh, uh, use all that you've given us for your glory. And God, I ask that you would use this preaching this morning for your glory, that you would be exalted here in this preaching of your word, your truth, your gospel, that we all would delight to celebrate who you are and what you've done and what you've promised to do in Christ. So God, I ask that you would lead me as I go. Of course, God, please uh, guard my heart that what comes out of my mouth is helpful and right for your people. It's true and good. Uh, for our maturity in Christ. And so, God, have your way here as we read your word. And please come soon. Amen. Well, the first chapter in Luke describes this foretelling of the births of both John the Baptist and Jesus the Christ. So God said word to both of their moms, Elizabeth and Mary, they're related, that they would have these sons. So Mary went to visit Elizabeth after Mary learned that she would have a child. Elizabeth was already pregnant, and her baby, John the Baptist, leaped with joy in her womb when he heard Mary's voice. So Elizabeth greeted Mary warmly when she saw her, and then, and then Mary responded, starting in verse 46, as Mary's response. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. So Mary rejoiced in God her Savior. What exactly is this joy? 
Well, Mary might say that her joy is this unstoppable feeling that springs from seeing Jesus as he really is. So when Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, she's not describing a fact like two plus two equals four. She's describing a feeling. So this rejoicing is a feeling, but it's not the temporary feeling. It's not a fleeting feeling like the unreliable happiness that comes from the occasional sunny day in winter here in Wisconsin. So, so Mary's unstoppable joy was in God, her Savior. It was rooted in God's unchanging character and his promises. So Mary saw Jesus for who he really is. She believed. Mary was told this and she believed that, that the baby born to her would somehow be God's promised Messiah. Well, the language Mary uses here in her rejoicing shows her familiarity with the Old Testament scriptures. So this is a teenage Jewish girl who had been trained in the Lord's ways by her parents. So Mary's words are also uh, similar to Hannah's celebration upon receiving her child, Samuel. Samuel grew up and God used him to lead his people Israel before the time of King David. So Mary's words are also similar to the words of the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. So God spoke through Habakkuk to point forward to God rescuing his people while judging his enemies. So Habakkuk wrote this. He said, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Does that sound familiar? Well, the broader idea of Habakkuk chapter 3 is that while God's judgment on the nations is horrible, his salvation of his people will be wonderful. So this is what made Habakkuk rejoice. And this is what made Mary rejoice in God, her Savior. Well, Luke 1 verse 55 tells us that Mary's joy is also rooted in her faith that God will remember his promise to Abraham and to his offspring forever. So Mary's pregnancy led her to believe that she had been given this front row seat to God fulfilling his covenant promises in her generation. Can you imagine? So Mary's joy is rooted in the unchanging character of God who always fulfills his promises to his people. Well, there's another key element here that's clear early on in Luke, but not necessarily in these particular verses. And that is that all of this is a work of God the Holy Spirit. Verse 15 of chapter 1 speaks of John the Baptist being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then uh, in verse 41, uh, it speaks of the baby John the Baptist uh, leaping in Elizabeth's womb. So then Elizabeth herself, it's, uh, Scripture says that she is filled with the Holy Spirit when she hears Mary's voice. She is... Uh, thrilled. And so it's the Holy Spirit who empowers people to have this unstoppable feeling of joy that comes from seeing Jesus as he is. All of this was about seeing Jesus as he is. So during this first Sunday, in, during, I'm sorry, the first Sunday in Advent, I mentioned a scene described in Luke chapter 24 that Jesus is walking along with a few men. This is after his resurrection. And these guys didn't recognize Jesus. And they're astounded that this man, Jesus, who they didn't recognize, they're astounded that he, he didn't know what was happening, seemingly. He said, what, 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 are, what events are you speaking of? And so they, they described it and they said, yeah, we heard this rumor that this Jesus is no longer in the grave. And, and they couldn't believe that, that Jesus hadn't heard this. <laughs> and so then, then it says that at that point, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So Jesus made the point that, hey, you know what? The whole Old Testament points forward to God's promised Messiah, and you're talking to him. So a few verses later, it says that their eyes were opened, and they recognized who Jesus is. They recognized him for who he is. So these men could not have opened their own eyes. Their eyes were opened by the Holy Spirit. And then they were filled with joy because they saw Jesus as he is. This is entirely a gift from God. So this morning, we'll understand joy as the unstoppable feeling that springs out of seeing Jesus as he is. So I had to wrestle with this this week. I had to look in a mirror and say, how much of your life, Paul, is marked by this unstoppable joy? Last couple of days, I can't say as much, but I, I was preaching on joy. I knew something had to happen, right? So... So how much of your life is marked by this unstoppable joy? Or how much would you want it to be? Well, 
I believe that our joy in Jesus Christ will increase as we embrace and proclaim his gospel. I think that's a biblical principle. So we've seen joy. So the next question is, what exactly is the gospel? So please turn in your Bibles one page forward to Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Verse 8 begins. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So picture this scene. <laughs> so we have some ordinary guys on the clock, <laughs> doing their jobs, they're shepherding a flock of sheep, and all of a sudden, they see an angel surrounded by this blinding light of the glory of the Lord. Well, that will be startling enough. <laughs> but then the angel starts talking to him. And he says, don't be afraid. <laughs> and he says, I'm bringing you good news of great joy. So it's just not just another day at the office for these shepherds. <laughs> An angel's talking to him. Well, this, this good news of great joy, this phrase good news is the English translation of a Greek word, that we get the word gospel from. So the word gospel literally means good news. I'm bringing you the gospel, the angel said. So this week's Advent insert, as I mentioned during welcome, has a detailed explanation of the gospel with a bunch of Bible verses. I would encourage you to take time to go through that this week. Look up the verses. If, you get, if you're a, a child of school age, you can read. I encourage you to try and look up those verses on your own and read through this whole message with your parents. This is a detailed explanation of the gospel. So we could certainly spend a lifetime, we could, do, we, we could spend the rest of our lives celebrating and, and uh, considering what the gospel is and what the gospel does. But for our purposes this morning, let's turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. So God created human beings to be in a relationship with himself, and with one another, certainly. So the first two human beings sinned, that is, they rebelled against God's authority, and brought this penalty on themselves and on all of creation, and that penalty is death. Well, no one can restore this broken relationship. No one can take away death by their own good work. No one can cover it up with a, even a million fig leaves. And so God, in his mercy, did this work through the perfect life and the sacrificial death and the triumphant resurrection of Jesus the Christ. This is the only work that can restore us to a right relationship with God. So this great gift of salvation is the gift of grace received through faith. So that's the gospel in a nutshell. So this New Testament book called Romans is all about the gospel and what it is and what it does. It begins like this. It says, To all those in Rome who are loved by God, and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So th this letter is written to people in Rome who are already saints. The Bible uses that word to describe ordinary Christians. And then he says, you're children of our Father. You're, you're a child of God. I'm a child of God. This is our Father. And then in verse 7 he says, so in other words, because of that, as a result of that, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you. So he wants to preach the gospel to people who are already Christians? Yeah. yeah in fact, a few verses later, it says that there's, there, it gives one reason why he would, he would preach the gospel to Christians who already believe it. He writes this in verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. See the theme of faith there. So the gospel itself is not just the good news of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. But the gospel is the power of God. So how are we to respond to this power? Well, the Bible tells us to embrace it. And proclaim it. So I, I use the word embrace rather than the word believe. I use it synonymously with the word believes. I chose the word embrace 
because I want to make sure that we have a biblical understanding of what it means to believe the gospel. So when the Bible talks about believing something, it's not in the same way that, that you might say, I believe Antarctica is really cold. I mean, you believe that to be true, right? But, but you, you've never experienced the cold, and it doesn't affect your daily life at all. So it, it doesn't really mean anything. So it's not just that kind of believing. When the Bible talks about believing something, it's more like you might say that you believe that breathing sustains your life. You're constantly breathing. <laughs> and this intake of oxygen significantly affects your life. So this is the kind of picture that the Bible paints about believing. You're, you're constantly doing this, and it's constantly affecting your life. Well, Luke chapter 2 tells us that the shepherds had a biblical belief. That is, they embraced and proclaimed the gospel. This good news of great joy. So starting in verse 11 of Luke chapter 2. Back in Luke chapter 2, verse 11. There's a familiar verse. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Let's pause it. Verse 16. So this starts with one angel talking to the shepherds. He tells them to not be afraid. And then he talks to them. <laughs> he says, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then they see the sky filled with angels praising God. So no ordinary day at work here. So verse 11 gives three titles for God's promised Messiah. It says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So three titles. Savior, Christ, Lord. So Savior, this baby is the deliverer who has come to rescue those who cannot rescue themselves. Christ. This baby really is God's promised Messiah, the Lord. This baby is the supreme authority over all creation. This baby is the Savior, Christ, the Lord. So the shepherd's response, of course, is not at all ho-hum. None of them said, like, hey, we're on the clock, angel. We're, we're not leaving it. We're not doing anything. No, the shepherds went with haste. And then they found Mary and Joseph and, and this baby lying in a manger. So we continue in verse 17 of Luke chapter 2. And when the shepherds saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Well, you can tell the shepherds believed or embraced the gospel because they were moved to action. Right away, they went and saw and they proclaimed this good news of great joy as it had been told to them. God is always faithful to fulfill his word. The shepherds could only know this gospel, this good news of great joy, because God gave his word through a messenger. So in order for anyone to embrace the gospel, for anyone to believe the good news of salvation by grace, through faith in Christ, they must first hear someone proclaim it. And you know what? God gives you and me this great privilege to fulfill that same role that the angels did for the shepherds on that first Christmas day. God, the Holy Spirit, empowers all believers to proclaim this good news of great joy. So how do we do that? How, how, how do we proclaim the gospel? Well, if I start 
Happy birthday to... Like, there's nobody who doesn't know the rest of that song. You, you know it because you, you've heard it. You've sung it to others. You've heard it sung to you every year. And, and you know it. You've rehearsed it. You're so familiar with it. Well, you know it because people told you about it. People sung it to you. No, none of us made up the happy birthday song. So we know God's gospel because of God's word. So as we read it, God, God puts his word in our heads and kind of writes it on our hearts. And so ultimately, it's God the Holy Spirit who empowers us to embrace his gospel, to believe his gospel, and learn it and rehearse it to ourselves. So just think about your own story. Think about how God transformed you, transformed your life just little by little and continues to do so as you embrace the gospel. So an easy way you can proclaim the gospel is by telling your own story of how God rescued you. It's got to include the gospel. That's how you've been rescued. So I suggest to you that doing that, sharing the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, certainly with your actions, but also with words, increases our joy in Jesus because it increases our awareness of his great love that met us in our greatest need. Well, that's what Christmas is about too. God's great love has met us in our greatest need. So this increasing joy can happen every time that you tell a person about your rescue. Well, God opened a timely door for me this past Monday. I got a call at 20 to 5. <laughs> I had a call from someone who swerved and missed a few deer on Highway 44 coming in from Oshkosh to work here at Alliance. He rolled the car and totaled the car that he had bought the previous week. Well, God opened a door for a conversation with the tow truck driver a little after 5 a.m. I introduced myself. We made a bit of small talk. I wanted to hear about it himself and his family, his background, and so on. And then I just asked him if he's familiar with the word gospel. Kind of shrugged the shoulders and looked at me sheepishly and kind of nodded and kind of not. And so I was like, well, you mind if I, mind if I tell you what the word means? He's like, sure. So his name is Brian. So... I will say, the look on Brian's face told me that not a lot of other people ask him that same question at 5 o'clock in the morning when he's connecting a drunk car to his tow truck. But I digress. So Brian and I had a good conversation. I was able to share the gospel with him. He was happy to have me pray for him. He told me a little bit about his, about his family and his daughter and so on. And you don't even know. I was bursting with joy just to try to keep it between the white lines on the way back. Just that God would give me this opportunity because I never know if I'll see this guy Brian again. I mean, I hope not when he's at work, you know. But I, but I, I never know. But I, but I hope I see him in heaven. And I could, by God's grace. And maybe he took hold of that gospel. Maybe he received that gospel. And maybe he's telling it to somebody else right now. That's how it works. So let me just say that there was a point in my journey with God that I could not have done that. It's all of grace. And God equips each of us in different ways. We're all a work in progress. So... I encourage you to take time to get to know people. Probably your, your gospel conversations won't be with random people. Some of you might. Some of you like to do that. Like me, I like to do that. But many of us, it'll come just earning the right to be heard, engaging people in a relationship, and letting them see our transformed life. As we take hold of the gospel, it will take hold of us. And the people who we know and love, and love and know us, our little circle, they will see that as they see our, our joy increase as we proclaim the gospel to them. Oh. Something I noticed this week as I went through the Gospel of Jesus according to Luke is that the words joy or rejoice are found over 20 times in, in, in Luke. And so you know what? Almost every time, a little trivia for you, almost every time they relate to the Gospel. <laughs> whether it's a parable about the Gospel, whether it's preaching about the Gospel, whether it's some narrative that points to the Gospel, there's this common thread through Luke that the Gospel brings joy. And again, I say joy is this unstoppable feeling that from see, this unstoppable joy that, see, that comes from seeing Jesus as he really is. And I was thinking back to last week. Well, last week we were in Isaiah chapter 9. And the fact is, Isaiah chapter 9 is bursting with joy at the future fulfillment of God's promise to carrying out his rescuing work. We read there, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. 
Well, this, remember, the, this phrase, you have multiplied the nation, looks back on God's fulfillment of his promise to Abraham. So here they are in a tough time going, oh, God's fulfilled his promise. He's made another one. He's going to fulfill that one too. And it gives me joy. And you see what follows there? After you have multiplied the nation, joy, joy, joy. We can go back a verse slide. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. So God fulfilling his promises brings increasing joy to his people. So the more we saturate our minds with God's promises and God's fulfillment and God's future promise that trusting it to be fulfilled, the more we are overflowing with joy. So remember that Jesus' first coming is only half of what we celebrate at Advent. Advent is also about anticipating Jesus' return. So just think about this. What, what relief this brings believers in this broken world that someday Jesus, he was Savior, Christ the Lord, will come back and make all things right for God's people. So again, I say it's God the Holy Spirit who empowers every believer to embrace this gospel. As we learn it, we rehearse it to ourselves. So it, if you listen to the same song over and over again, it's already put the birthday song in your head. <laughs> But you can memorize it pretty easily. So the same is true with the gospel. So except infinitely more so because the Holy Spirit empowers it, empowers this gospel as we rehearse it to ourselves. So if you want to find the gospel in a few verses, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, or Titus 3, verses 3 through 7. If you want to start out Ephesians 2, you can just do 3 or 4 through 7. There's a chunk there. But this isn't much. It's really a tiny paragraph, and it is life to us. So I encourage you to just pick one of those and memorize the gospel. Memorize the gospel in a nutshell in scripture. If you have a phone, many of us do, you have a phone that you can record on. Even if you don't like hearing your own voice, ask somebody else to do it. But just read those couple verses in your phone and then maybe in the shower or in the restroom or getting ready for supper or anything else. Hit play and listen to that. Just saturate your head. Embrace that gospel so that you will know and love and understand the gospel. So another example might be maybe if you took piano or guitar lessons as a kid, you can relate to this. My parents paid for guitar lessons for me, and I asked them to, and they were paying, and then they made me practice. Most of the time, I was not real excited about it. But you know what? As I learned to play the guitar, I enjoyed it more and more. It can work the same way with scripture memory. And by the way, Becky, I haven't played guitar for decades, so <laughs> I won't be up here anytime soon playing guitar. So, so this week's Advent series insert is uh, in the worship guide. It's titled, What is the Gospel? As I held it up before, now I can't find it. But it has a graphic at the top, and I think you're familiar with this by now. So it says, Advent 2020, Christmas on Purpose. So that Christmas on Purpose idea came to me as I reflected on this past year. Our, our summer series was Lenses for Life. We walked through this the attributes of God and seeing that seeing God clearly allows us the freedom to see ourselves clearly. And so when we're purposeful about seeing God clearly, we realize we don't have to be afraid to be honest with ourselves about the sin in our own hearts. In fact, the greatest freedom for a Christian comes in recognizing that, yeah, you are more sinful than you ever allowed yourself to admit. And you know what else? That God's love for you really is greater than you've ever dared to dream. And so, so these lenses, this seeing God clearly and seeing ourselves clearly, lead to this great freedom. These lenses remind us of this importance of being purposeful to see God clearly as he reveals himself in his word. Why a Christmas tree in one lens and a, a cross in the other? Isn't a cross for Good Friday? Yeah, it is, but it's also for Christmas. Remember that this baby that we celebrate at Christmas was born to die. It wasn't a mistake that he was crucified. Jesus was born to die for you. All of this is God, part of God's eternal purpose. God, the eternal son, took on human flesh to live a perfectly righteous life, die a completely sacrificial death that he didn't deserve, and then to rise triumphantly from the grave in place of all who believe so that we could have new life in him forever. That's the good news of great joy. That's the gospel. But think, Christmas means very little if it's ever separated from that. 
Christmas means very little if it's not put into the broader context of God's great plan to rescue a people for himself. Well, it's no secret that 2020 has not been an easy year <laughs> for anyone. So God created us to seek joy. None of us wants less joy. We, we want joy and, and satisfaction. So our friends and neighbors and co-workers, they're longing for real joy now more than ever. And we know where to find it. So how might God use you this week to impact your friends or family or neighbors by telling them about this unstoppable feeling of joy that comes from seeing Jesus as he really is, seeing him clearly on purpose? I'd encourage you to consider that our joy in Jesus Christ increases as we embrace this gospel and as we proclaim this gospel. So really, think about that. How, how might the good news of Christmas and the good news of the other half of Advent, his return to make all things right. How might that impact people that you know and love? Do you love them enough to risk them maybe being bothered by you uh, for a little bit to, to hear about their sin and to hear about their need for a Savior? Well, a good step in the right direction might be just passing along that Christmas Eve invitation card. There's some folks among us who are who just told me this morning they are embracing the gospel and proclaiming the gospel. They said, I'm going to grab these other, these other cards. I'm going to pass them on to my neighbor. I'm going to bake something for them and pass them along because the same good news that we've received and embraced and brought us such great joy, we want our neighbors to experience that too. That's what I'm talking about. I love to see that in the church. That's, that's wonderful. What a thrill to see you all and many of you doing that. It's wonderful. So, so one of the great ways that the gospel increases our joy in Jesus is increasing our awareness of his great love that has met us in our greatest need. Again, we don't jump and knock on somebody's door and say, hey, I just want to say you're sinned, you're steeped in sin at birth, you're steeped in sin and you're headed straight for hell, but I got good news. That's not how we do it, but it has to be part of it. Well, the Gospel of Jesus, according to Luke, has one of my favorite accounts of Jesus interacting with both a religious leader and an ordinary person. The, the religious leader invited Jesus to his house to have a meal. Well, Jesus had already become a bit of a celebrity by then, and so there's a crowd of people outside the man's house while Jesus is eating the meal. Well, at some point, a person known to be a sinful woman, well-known in the community, she entered the house, she wept at Jesus' feet, she wiped his feet with her tear, uh, she, she wet his feet with her tears, wiped it with her hair, then kissed his feet and anointed them with expensive ointment. Then the religious leader starts thinking something to himself. And Jesus answered his thoughts by offering to tell him a story. <laughs> Would you be a bit unsettled if you were thinking something and somebody said, hey, I, I, I have an answer for what you're thinking. Me too. <laughs> Me too. So, so Jesus told the religious leader this story about two people who owed money to this money lender. One of them owed a bunch of money, just an unbelievable amount of money. You can't pay it back in a lifetime. And the other owed a relatively small amount of money. Well, the banker, Jesus says, imagine that the banker canceled the debt of both. Then Jesus asked the religious leader, who do you think will love the banker more? <laughs> he says, why, well, I suppose the one who's had the bigger debt canceled. Well, Jesus isn't talking about money here. Jesus is presenting this biblical principle that the extent to which a person acknowledges their debt of sin that God has canceled by grace through faith in Christ is similar to the extent that they are grateful and joyful in response. Well, the religious leader thought of himself as a pretty good person. He didn't recognize much debt. Just thought it was just a small amount. He, he didn't recognize that sin isn't just a behavior. It's a heart condition. The debt is infinite. So every human being has this deadly heart condition that cannot be solved through good works. No effort can solve this heart condition. And yet the gospel, the gospel, this, this good news of great joy, this gospel increases our joy in Jesus by increasing our awareness of his great love that met us in our greatest need. 
So the more we recognize God's amazing grace to us in this good news of great joy, the more we have real joy, the more we have unstoppable joy, this unstoppable feeling that springs out of seeing Jesus clearly on purpose, just as he is. Beloved of God, I proclaim to you today, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Savior. This baby is the deliverer who has come to rescue those who cannot rescue themselves. Christ. This baby is God's Messiah, promised years and years ago. The Lord. This baby is the supreme authority over all creation, even that little feeding trough he's been placed in. So this gift of God's grace that we celebrate at Christmas is not at all like the thousands of scented candles and fancy soaps and picture frames that will be re-gifted this year and the next. This incredible gift of God's grace cancels this enormous debt of sin. Everyone desperately needs this gift. And all of you who re-gift it <laughs> by embracing and proclaiming this gift, this gospel, this good news of great joy, you will have increasing joy in Jesus Christ forever. You know what this comes down to? He who is mighty has done a great thing, as Mary said. God, the eternal Son, Jesus, has taken on flesh to conquer death's sting. We'll close this morning with a song for reflection. He who is mighty has done a great thing. And so, beloved of God, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forever and ever. Go in peace with this great God. Amen.